trafficked, so it's also filtering the flow. Um, the Medicaid fraud part, elder abuse, and um, also tribes, and that is just an organization where law enforcement and senior citizens get together and they form a group. And they but in the box, I have to show you what some of them are because if you if I didn't tell you, you wouldn't know how to open some of them. This is the manicure kit, and then this this is a brush and a mirror to poke through. But on the back, if you unscrew the back, it, there's a little sewing kit on it, and you wouldn't know that if you if I didn't show you that. And then there's a back scratcher and a pencil and a pen. Um, Flash drive, a jar opener, you know, when you can't grab the glass, then well. And then this is the neatest thing, it goes on the back of your cell phone. And oh, my cell phone's back there. But you can put all of your credit cards in it or business cards, and it's easy to keep them all in one place and they just won't fall out. It's called a kangaroo pouch. And I appreciate you all letting me come and introduce myself. And if you ever need anything or any of our services, or like I said, know of someone that needs our services, you're more than welcome to give them my information. My lucky business card, I think, on everyone's seat. If not, there's a few extra over there. Okay, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll see you soon. Thank you for all the awesome goodies. Okay, so as I mentioned, um, this is going to be a working session today, so we're actually going to, I want you to hopefully leave here with some clear steps to achieving a financial goal. So those of you that are watching via the live stream, I want you to grab a piece of paper and a pencil and you're going to work along with us. I know you don't have all the handouts, but um, hopefully this is going to work to where you would, you'll still be able to participate. As Kathy said, my name is Cindy Green and I'm a People Incorporated and we're a nonprofit economic development agency. We were actually founded in 1964. We have over 40 programs. The program that I work with is our Community Economic Development Department. And we do have some resources available that I'm going to tell you about at the end of the session that may assist you in achieving your financial goal, depending on what that may be. So the first thing we're going to do while our live streamers are getting a piece of paper and a pen or a pencil, we'll pass out the green handout to those of you that are here today. And while we're doing that, I have also have the QR code there for you to scan for those of you that are in the class today and then those of you that are live streaming. I'm hoping this will work where if you have the QR reader on your phone or your iPad. If you hold it up to um, the screen, you should be able to scan this so that you can have the PowerPoint to watch it on your own device. I know it's kind of hard to see this sometimes with the lighting in here. So go ahead and be doing that, and then we're going to move on to achieving your financial goals. So when you hear that term, what comes to mind? Just automatically, what's the first thought that, hit, that comes to your mind? Freedom. Freedom. Responsibility. Responsibility. There's some work in by watching <coughs> live. I'm going to actually read these out loud so that you can write them down on your paper. So we're going to take a few minutes to write down our responses. The first step is I want you to write down the first eight to ten words that come to mind when you think of the word money. Don't overthink it, just start brainstorming. One word that you would associate with money, eight to ten of them. Go ahead and start doing that now. Everybody got 8 to 10. I don't want you to overthink it. 
Now I want you to underline all the words that you have identified that you think have a negative connotation regarding money. Underline the ones that you think are negative. And now I want you to write down three things that you are proud of in terms of your relationship to money. Three things that you are proud of <coughs> in terms of your relationship to money. We're on number I tested it three times. It says four on four arrows. Yeah. That's what you were getting too. It may have been just in the printing. Sometimes when you print them multiple times, they okay. won't work. If your QR reader is not, if the code's not working, if you can just um, shoot me an email and I'll be glad to send you the presentation. Thing. I wonder if we can you try it from hold up one of your hold it up to the screen here and see if it works. <laughs> Identify full experience with money. And then the flip side of that would be number seven, write down your most painful experience with money. And number eight would be, which of those memories was easiest for you to recall? Was it easier for you to come up with a joyful experience when it, you think about money, or was it easier for you to come up with a painful experience? And then number nine is based on your answers, what do you think one of your money scripts is? Meaning, what do you think that you subconsciously or yeah, subconsciously think uh, or unconsciously think of when you think of money. Based on what your answers were. And then the last question, the Dr. Phil question is, how's that working for you? Does anybody want to share what they feel like maybe one of their unconscious money scripts? <coughs> yes. So I wrote, if I don't manage my money, my manage my money will manage me. Okay. That's so it takes control of you then if you don't and take my control. My entire life and my happiness and yeah. Yeah, my goals and all of that. Yeah. Who else raised their hand? Yes. Hard to manage. Hard to manage. So that's the script that you have running in your mind. Is that it's back here you're thinking money's hard to manage, and then you're thinking if I don't get if I don't have control of this, it's going to control me. Well, it's directly or indirectly related to everything that you do. I mean, it is from work to shopping to food to children to. It's very to powerful. I mean, everything you do, money is tied to. It yes. Somewhere. Yes. So the reason that I had you do this, instead of just jumping into um, giving you tools to achieve your financial 
goal is we all basically know that we need to pay our bills on time. We all know that we need to have more money coming in than we have going out. Not really rocket science, is it? But it's the relationships that we have with money that dictates our behavior and how we handle our money. And that may be why we're not able to achieve our financial goals is because of these scripts that we have running in our mind and it's, it's hindering us. So what are some of the money management obstacles? Can anyone give me some, uh, some things that they think of as obstacles in being able to uh, manage your money and or achieve your financial goal? Everything's too easily accessible. Which, what can happen when things are easily accessible? You spend too much. You spend too much, you might get sidetracked. Yeah. Here are some um, that they've listed as the top money management obstacles. One being denial. This is an internal obstacle. It's easy to remain in that state of denial, isn't it? Because as long as you don't look at it or think about it, then you don't have to do anything about it. Right? So we kind of think of uh, an ostrich with, with its head in the sand. Because if you know, if, if you have the knowledge, then there's more pressure to change your behavior. How about fear? There's fear associated with money, isn't there? Um, and sometimes that fear can cause people to freeze and become paralyzed and they don't do anything. It's often stressed that having fear itself is not the problem, but it's how we deal with having that fear. And again, that's a behavioral, an internal behavior. How about lack of specific goals? Other than New Year's resolutions, most families don't have a specific personal financial goal. And here's a kicker, and we're gonna work on this today. If a goal is not written down, and quantified, it's really little more than a dream. And we talk about that when we do entrepreneur training. Um, we'll have on, potential entrepreneurs come to trainings and they have a business idea. And then the next question we ask is, do you have a business plan, a written business plan? And they look at you like, well, no, but I've got it all up here. Until it's actually written down and you flesh out the, the things that could go wrong and the things, um, you know, you measure it, then it's really nothing more than a dream. And it's also motivational if you write it down. It makes it a little more solidified if you write it down, doesn't it? And then there's those negative thought patterns, which we just went through a little exercise to figure out what your money scripts are. Do you have a positive or a negative association with money? The good news is negative thought patterns are curable. It's just a matter of practice. And the trick to that is to be counter negative thinking patterns with positive for example, thinking, I'll never pay off my debt. Another way of saying that would be, I will pay off 500 per month over the next six months. So instead of letting that recording play in my head, oh, this is just too much, I can't do it, you actually get it down into concrete and hold yourself accountable. How about impatience? That could be a money management obstacle. Someone already mentioned about the accessibility to credit is one thing. It's so easy. We don't really have to be patient, do we? We can just go ahead and buy it. Statistics show that individuals are, that are less patient have lower credit scores and higher default rates. So we know that's really not the way that we need to manage our finances. So impatience can be an obstacle. And how about short-sightedness? It's one of the causes of debt because it's a whole lot easier to go ahead and make that purchase of that nice uh, HD TV and all of its glory. It's easier to go ahead and just buy that than to think about, well, I'm thinking about retirement, as Jan mentioned. Retirement seems so far away, and it's not as new, it's not as bright and shiny as that new TV is, or whatever the case may be. And then another of uh, money management obstacles, but what about all those external things?
How about all the advertising we're constantly inundated with? That girl is eating that hamburger on a daily basis and looks like that. I mean, we are constantly getting these mixed signals on um, what we should be doing. And then how about the keeping up with the Joneses? Especially if you have teenagers, that one's tough. But mom, everybody has the new iPhone 6. Or mom, everybody has the new $150 tennis shoes. I don't know what tennis shoes are now. They're probably more than $150. But when my daughters were teenagers, they had to have the name brand of everything. And as adults, we get caught in that trap too, don't we? We see our neighbor... Our neighbor just did a home improvement, or our neighbor just got a new car. And you're like, well, why can't, why am I driving a car that has 150,000 miles on it? Everybody else is driving new cars. That's not fair. And then how about environmental influences, those weekly lunches out with coworkers? If everybody's going out to lunch and I packed mine, Jerry's a perfect example of that. <laughs> I don't think it's fair, Jerry, that I eat an apple and you're getting to eat spaghetti and salad. I know a uh, really good way you can fix that. How is that? <clears throat> Stop by Moon Dog. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then just higher costs. Things are costing more. Uh, food's going up. Uh, well, gas actually has come down. But overall, things are just more expensive. So that makes it tough to keep us on task. And I just put this little slogan up here, change, if you keep doing what you're doing, you'll keep getting what you're getting. So unless we make some changes, we're not going to be able to achieve our goals. So we've got another handout, and this one may be a little harder for our live cast. I put it up there. Hopefully it's legible to you. Um, this one's kind of a short little activity, and we're going to pass out it's the green or the red paper that Natasha's passing out. And I want you to think about your personal values in general. And in the list below, I want you to circle the top three personal values. Again, I don't want you to overthink it. I just want you, whatever jumps out on the page, you circle three that you feel are your top three personal mm -hmm. values. And I apologize if you're not able to see that on the live stream. Again, if this is something that I can make available to you and you can do this activity later if you're not able to see it. Top three personal values. <coughs> and those of you that have got your top three, I want you to think about when you're getting ready to make a financial decision, when it's time to decide whether you're going to make a purchase or you're going to wait, I want you to put a rectangle around the three values that you feel guide you the most when you're making a financial decision or you're taking a financial action. So the first three you're circling and those are just your personal values and then number two is what do you think guides you when you're making a financial decision or action and put a rectangle around them. Do you have the same one? Do you have a circle and triangle around the same ones? 
you see any areas of conflict and or alignment? Natasha's nodding, so all yours align? No, uh, in fact, um, one of the ones, you know, my circles are accomplishment and acknowledgement and service because those are the things that are important to me personally. Um, but my financial decisions are guided by directness, which is kind of in line with those things. Right. And integrity, which is kind of in line with those things. And excitement, which is totally outside the box. <laughs> okay. There's no right or wrong answer. It's just to make you aware of what your personal values are and then what values do you use when it comes to spending your money. And they may or may not be in the line. Alignment, and that's something you want to be aware of is that excitement thing where you make sometimes you make financial decisions based on excitement is that is that fulfilling your personal values and that's what you want to look at So you want to ask yourself if what you're doing today is getting you closer to where you want to be tomorrow. Now, you can flip over a sheet of paper or if you have a spare piece of paper there. We're going to do some questions and then we're going to kind of um, see where you come up on your financial personality. And the people that are live streaming will be able to participate in this. I just want you to like list 1 through 12 on the page. And the first question, you're just going to write, write your answer next to number one. I'm most likely to blow the budget, A, in a designer clothes shop because you adore fashion, or if you're on a family holiday and you want everybody to have fun, or overspend, not if I can help it. Which one of those would be you? And I want you to put that letter next to the number one. When an unexpected bill arrives in the mail, I A, shove it in a drawer with all the others, B, add it to my to-do list, or C, check that it's correct and pay it immediately. What do you do if it's a combination? Put, put the two letters, okay. A and B or B and C, whatever the case may be. And then um, when I tell you how this and we're going to kind of analyze what your financial personality is, and then you'll know that you may be a little bit of both. I prefer to put everything on a credit card and think about it later, or keep credit for major buys and use my debit card for everyday expenses, or I use my debit card as much as possible so I stay within my budget. A, B, or C. At any given time, I A, don't know how much I owe, and I try not to think about it, or B, can tell roughly what my debt amounts to, or C, know exactly what's outstanding and I have a plan to reduce it. I have overdraft arrangement because A, I'm always in the red by the end of the month, or B, the kids are all, they always want things and I don't have time to save up, or C, if I need it, a prearranged overdraft charges less interest. I'm sorry, I can't see this. I'm sorry. Thank you. Trying to stay in the video and not block you guys. Uh, when I get my credit card statement, I normally repay A, the minimum, and sometimes that comes from another credit card or B, as much of the outstanding amount as possible, or C, the entire balance. My monthly budget is A, an ideal rather than a reality. I never have enough money to go around. Or B, usually okay, but I sometimes overspend. Or C, occasionally a struggle, but I generally stick to it. I am A, carefree with money, I enjoy today, and I let tomorrow look after itself. B, I, likely, I am likely to overspend every now and then. Or C, I, always, I am always in control of my finances. Mm -hmm. 
When I need to borrow, I take whatever I'm offered and I get another credit card or loan when I reach my spending limit. Or I go to the first decent looking offer I get. Or I shop around for the best deals on credit cards and loans. I always read the small print. Savings are, what savings? I spend every penny that comes in. It's A or B, there to pay for important things such as a deposit for a home of our own or a new kitchen. Ah, new kitchen. C, part of the monthly budget plan. And number 11 is, if I received an unexpected $5,000 windfall, I would A, Knock a bit off my credit card bill, but spend the rest on a shopping mini break. Or B, I would pay off some debts and put the rest towards a new car. Or C, I would put it in a high interest account while I research ways of spending or investing. And the last one is, I get comfortable when A, I can't buy what I want as soon as I see it, or I can't afford to treat my friends and family, or I can't identify all the transactions on my bank statement. Which one of those applies to you? Now I want you to add up your A, B's, and C's, and Write down which letter did you choose the most often. Are. This is your profile. Money is for enjoying as far as you're concerned. You may consider luxuries such as a new computer, cars, designer clothes as modern essentials, which can make it hard to cut back. You will tend to have a great time, though, until your overspending catches up with you. You need to remember that credit isn't free cash and that all your bills ultimately have to be paid. You might want to avoid temptation by saving a small but regular amount to pay off your debts and learning to say no. All right, if B was your predominant letter, you consider money is for sharing with others and for living a comfortable life. You're quite well organized financially but are unlikely to overspend, but are likely to overspend when you're stressed or unhappy. And you can excuse your extravagance if it's designed to make other people happy. You might want to start saving a little and often so that you can afford to indulge those you love. Drawing up a budget that prioritizes that priorities essentials over treats and learn to say no more often. And then the C's. If we have any C's in here, your pro profile is money is for security, which is fine when you have enough of it to feel safe. When you're short, you feel panic stricken. You're more often than capable, you're more than capable of sticking to a sensible budget, making repayments on time and saving for the future. You might want to start paying off debts before you add the savings, asking for advice and help if you're in trouble, and learn to manage your level of debt sensibly. There's really not a wrong or right answer because everyone's different. So if you came to this session for me to tell you what you should do for your financial goals, that's going to be what my financial goals are or how that I would feel comfortable achieving those. It's not necessarily how you're going, are, are not going to match what your goals are, and they're definitely not going to match your money relationships and your money behaviors. So that's why we're spending some time on this in the beginning, is you've got to figure out what is important to you, what are things that you are willing to 
compromise on. And then what things are no way, you're not giving it up. And that may be Starbucks coffee. You know, I might be able to say, well, you need to give up that $5 a day coffee, and, that, and there's some extra money that you would have. That may not be negotiable for you. That, that may be an important thing that you feel like you deserve and that you're going to do it every day. So for me to tell you what you should do is not, it's not going to work. So if you want something you've never had, you'll have to do something that you've never done. And we've got another activity here, which is our white sheet. And I want you to rate your current financial status with a zero being poor and the middle of the circle and a 10 being high, meaning the outside of the circle. And I don't want you to lift your pen or pencil up. And those of you that are at home watching this, you can just make a circle and then you can title the different sections. We have a section for savings for credit record, budgeting, insurance, like renters, homeowners, um, life insurance, <coughs> retirement, <coughs> banking, and health insurance. I don't know if I mentioned debt. So if you don't feel comfortable with this area at all, you're going to put a dot in the center or closer to the center. If you're feeling like you're doing a great job, then you're going to put it on the outside, towards the outside of the circle. So you're going to do a little dot for each one. So let's say that I feel good about, well, my credit score, we'll say, because I'm, I'm not at a 10 on really any of these. But let's say that I feel pretty good about where I am with my credit score, so I may put my dot closer to the outside of the circle. If I feel like I need to improve on my retirement, my circle may be towards the center on the line. So you're going to have a dot for each one of these. Once you get your dots, I want you to connect the dots. Who has a perfect circle? Kathy, go figure. <laughs> Miss Overachiever but, in the back. But it's not that. I think it has to do with where you are, if you have a family, in raising your children. Sure. And so, you know, if, if you're raising your children, you're never going to be where you want to be because, you know, all of your excess income goes to your mm -hmm. family. You know, I, I spend on them it's fun still, stuff. Yeah, it's still not as, um, yeah, it's it not doesn't as require as much as raising them on. Right, right, right. Um, okay, so you connected your dots. Now we're getting to the goal setting part. Which area do you want to improve in? doesn't necessarily have to be the one closest to the middle. It may, it's up to you. Which one of these areas do you want to improve? And you may have more than one, and that's okay. And let's take a little baby step here and say, what could you do... What financial goal 
could you set for that area in the next six weeks? Identify one, and what could you do in the next six weeks <coughs> that would move you closer to where you want it to be? So example, let's say that I had, I'm not really feeling good about where my savings is. What could I do in the next six weeks that would increase my savings? Anybody have any ideas? You could set a reasonably negligible amount um, to set aside for each paycheck. Okay. You know, 30 bucks. Sure. If you, if you take 30 bucks to 50 bucks out of every paycheck, you might have to you might have to modify something in your life, but you probably won't have to stop eating. Yeah. So that would be specific, would be measurable, attainable. Would it be attainable? Yeah, probably for, could for do that. For most people, if if you're worried about savings, then it will be attainable. Yeah. If it's not attainable, you probably have more immediate needs. True. Savings may not be my need. If I don't have an extra thirty dollars, I may have an issue with debt budgeting. that needs to be addressed, and/or budgeting, um, whatever the case may be. So you can determine what the goal is, and then what you could do in the next six weeks. Is there something that you could do to get you moving towards where you want to be with that financial goal? All right, I like this quote. The quickest way to double your money is to fold it over and put it back in your pocket. I just had to put that one because that's all I can kind of speak. Um, we're going to pass out our yellow sheets now. And this is where it's going to get real. I want you to identify a financial goal. I'm not collecting these and you don't have to share unless you just want to. What was that phrase that you had to do? This way to double your money is what? Fold it over and put it in your pocket. <laughs> <laughs> you know, with the local banks, I, I don't use any national banks, but with local banks now, you know, if you, if you have a, a if you set up so that you can put your account. They'll put all of your accounts on the website and you can transfer, you know, you can transfer money from your checking to your savings yep. yourself. You and know. I've got some uh, other sites here that I'm going to show you that are some mobile sites and that are some um, that may have mobile apps, but I've got a mixture. There's all kinds of really cool things out there to help you. Um, one of the things that I do, I think it's Wells Fargo has it because I think it's Wells Fargo, but um, I know all banks probably have this, but where they, every time I use my debit card, they take a dollar out of my account and transfer it to, it's called Way to Save. And it's a, I don't even. Go on and track all your expenses at any given time. It keeps them in the graph. All your, uh, in nice graph, all your debit card expenses, all the checks you write, everything is right there. One click, you see everything. Probably Perfect. shows you in a graph format or whatever. It's a little bit eye opening when you start <laughs> seeing where you're spending. How much, spend. you, spend how much you spend each week? You can do that. And I was like, oh my gosh, are you kidding me? Yeah. So has everyone got, the, got a goal written down? Okay. When do you want to reach that goal? Eight years. Okay. There's no right or wrong answer. It might be six months. It might be Kathy's is eight years. Um, yours might be ten. Whatever the case may be, <laughs> when do you want to reach that goal? What? I want you to list three things that you will do to help you reach that goal. <laughs> Jennifer's looking at me like this was all fun to I and you have made me write down something I'm gonna actually have to do here. When we write it down, it becomes real, doesn't it? When I 
did this exercise. I actually took this training um, in at a NeighborWorks conference in California, and I was going to the training to learn how to teach the training. Well, they made us actually do everything. And so they said, okay, I want you to determine a financial goal. And I was like, well, wait a minute. I didn't come it becomes more attainable, and it holds you accountable. But you have to add some accountability steps in there, and we're going to do that as well. Does anyone want to share what their goal is? Please. Be debt free. Debt free. Okay. When would you like to become debt free? Five years. Five years. What three steps can you take to help yourself achieve that goal? Well, I got some side things I'm working on to make more money, so that I'll okay. help. Okay. Increase income. <clears throat> um, pay more towards the principal on my loans. Pay more towards the principal. And also, I think, save more. And save more. There's your three steps. And how will you know, you will know you've reached your goal how? Because I won't have any. You will not have any more debt. What two things can you write down that will help you in sticking to this goal? Meaning, keeping you on task to where you've completed it in five years. You have to be held accountable. It's been my, it's been my goal for the last five years, too. I mean, as far as, like, I set that. Was it ten years then? No, no. Or was it? Yeah, it was ten then. Okay. So I set the goal, I guess, <clears throat> probably, probably 15 years before it, it was to be over, I guess. So in my early 30s, I set a goal to be debt-free by the time I'm 45. And I've worked towards that over the years. Be pretty close. If I'm not there, I'll still be close enough that it'll be worth it. Great. So your savings. <laughs> See, I think we're on the same track. <laughs> he will keep me. Maybe that's not who we want to be our accountability <laughs> partner. <laughs> and if you can share it with someone that you can check in with monthly, by text, by email, whatever the case may be, to where will you will you help me in achieving my goal? Will you send me a reminder or a phone call, text, email? and ask me, how are you doing with your goal? All right, so, and when you're doing a goal setting, you want to make sure that it is, um, this is a acronym SMART goal, and what that stands for is it needs to be specific, It needs to be measurable. So what do I mean by specific? He said debt free. Um, does anybody else want to share one, an, an example, or I can share mine? Natasha. I'll share mine. I, I have, I, I want, um, in, in the large sense, I want a savings cushion for emergencies or retirement. But what I really want is $1,000 to put on the stock market. Just okay. for me, for okay. mine. If it goes, it goes. If it builds, it builds. But it's mine. Okay. So, I I like the way you took that. You said you wanted. What was the first thing about a cushion? A, a cushion. A savings cushion. A savings cushion. Is that specific? It can be if you set a dollar amount. It's not specific until she sets a dollar amount. It's kind of vague because. So $1,000. $1,000. But then she took it to $1,000. That's specific. When do you want to achieve that? April 30th, 2016. Measurable. Is it attainable? I think so now. Okay. Is it relevant to what your, to your personal goals? Yes. Okay. And is it time bound? Yes. yes. Because I've set myself a, a time scale. Yeah. So that's how you take that idea that you have in your head or that dream that you have and you get it down to where it's actually attainable and it's specific and it's <coughs> measurable okay now I'm going to take you on some other items here that can help you in achieving this goal that you have come up with this financial goal that you've come up with are you going to need credit in order to achieve this goal I don't know what all your else goals are 
or you're going to need credit. And I, one of the things that I may think of when I think of uh, needing credit to achieve a financial goal, it may be home ownership. It may be sending a child to college. Uh, it may be buying a new car. Um, but you may not need credit to buy that car. I think in this day and time, it's pretty hard to buy a house just by saving because you're, you have those everyday living expenses, um, especially if you're paying rent. It's hard to save enough to pay cash for a house. So you may very well need credit for that. So I'm going to talk to you just a little bit about credit. Um, this website, if any of you are not familiar with it, is Credit Karma. And this is free. Everything I'm going to tell you about is free. And this is a good way for you to see what your credit score is, also to how to increase your credit score if you find out that you need to, you may not need to. And another thing that it does that I really like is anytime a new account is opened in your name, anytime you are closing in or getting close to your credit limit, they will send you an email. So it's almost like having that um, credit safeguard protection, but you're getting it for free. And it'll show you a nice cool graph, so if, you are, if, if improving your credit is one of your financial goals, it will show you as you go um, how your credit is, where you were and, how, and where you're at <coughs> now. If improving credit is one of your financial goals, then you would want to know where you're at now so that you know how you're, where you need to go. And so you would look at this, you would go to Credit Karma and you could say, okay, my credit score is a 550. I want to get my credit score up to 650. And I'm going to set a time frame of a year to try to make that happen. And then this is going to help you as far as trying to, uh, being able to monitor it. Just to let you know how credit score is generated, um, for those of you that don't know if it is one of your goals, the biggest a factor of your credit score is how you're paying your current payments and how you've paid them in the last two years. So improving, improving your credit score is something that you're wanting to achieve. The good news is it only the, the biggest factor that affects your credit is your payment history and it's only going to go back two years. So we're not having to worry about what you did five years ago. 35% um, of your score is based on how you've paid your payments in the last two years. And then how much you owe your creditors is the other big one. So if you're wanting to improve your credit score, you need to pay down that debt as um, quickly as you possibly can. And you want to make sure that you're paying those payments on time. And then there's some other indicators um, that don't affect it quite as much. But those are the two big ones. So if credit is one of your financial goals, that would be some information that can assist you there. And then Kathy had mentioned that um, the local banks have apps that you can download on your phone. Um, there's some other pretty cool websites that can help you in reaching your financial goals. Here's one. It's Mint, M-I-N-T. And I think you can consult. This is a phone app that you could download, and it's free, and it's personal capital, money, and investing. And I pulled up some more information on it. <coughs> what it does is um, lets you see all your accounts in one place and gives you a comprehensive view of your income, spending, and investment performance. Knowing what's happening with your money anytime, anywhere helps you save more and invest better. She said, plan, mint, my weekly budget, and personal capital money and investing and this one's got a lot of really good reviews from CNBC, CNN, Time, uh, Forbes, it's gotten a lot of good reviews and I think uh, yeah and, I, and I, like I was mentioning about whenever I download an app I always look at reviews, user reviews and this one had five stars, 183 people have reviewed it and given it five stars, that's pretty good. So that may be something that you want to try. Um, like I said, these are just a few of the ones that are out there. But unless you control your money, making more won't help you. You'll just have bigger payments. Um, we all know that those people that uh, you know, are making six figures but are, better, are still living paycheck to paycheck. It's not, I've always lived by the motto, it's not how much you make, it's how much you spend. And I've also got another handout here. This will be just for the 
people that are here in attendance, but we have these uh, managing income and expenses booklets, and I'm going to go through this with you and show you how you can use this. For those of you that maybe um, don't want to do it on the computer, don't want to do an app, we can go old school and break it down with a pencil and one of these books here. So to get control of your financial situation, you've got to understand where you are at now. And we're going to walk through that uh, in determining what your net worth is now. And you're going to need to create a budget and then obviously make informed choices. So to calculate your net worth, what you're going to want to do is you're going to look, you want to list everything that you own and you want to list everything that you owe. And Natasha, if you can yell out that page number. It's going to be on page five. Page five. Thank you. I guess I should have kept one for myself. Yeah, seriously, here, why don't you take one too? Thank you. So to figure out your net worth, you're going to list everything that you own and everything that you owe. If you own more than you owe, then you're in the positive. That means you're, you're getting ahead, right? If you're negative, that means you're falling behind. The next step in creating your financial goal or improving your financial situation is you're going to need to create a budget. In order to do that, the first thing that you've got, there's two variables with a budget. It's the money coming in and the money going out. So what we want to do is we want to identify all income coming in. That would be paychecks, interest, rental income, any income that you have coming in. We have a page number for that, Natasha. Income is page six and then the chart. <coughs> There's not a chart for income. Okay. Um, well, oh, wait, there is. 16, it's on page 16. 16 yeah. Sorry. So in order to identify all of your income, you can look at page 16 of this booklet. And like I said, those of you that are um, on live stream, you can just list this out. But what you're going to want to do is make sure that you are listing your gross income and then you, you're taking all the deductions out, and you're actually figuring your budget based on your net income. If I'm making $10 an hour and I work 40 hours a week, how much am I making per week? $400. Do I have $400 no. to budget? Why? Because I've got taxes, I've got insurance, um, anything else that may be coming out of my paycheck. So I need to budget my household budget based on Let's just say for easy $300 a week, don't I? Even though I make $400, I need to figure my budget on actually what I have to work with to cover my expenditures. And that's on page 16. Now, we've got to be able to track what our monthly expenses are. And that one can get kind of tricky. Uh, because as we discussed earlier, there's all kinds of temptations everywhere and Things are so accessible. I was watching a movie last night on Netflix um, called Fed Up. I don't know if you all have watched it yet or not, but they're talking about all the temptations when it comes to eating badly. And they were showing all these examples, and I thought, you know, I really never thought about it, but pretty much any store you go to anymore has candy, uh, all at kids' level. But the temptation, and no matter where we go, we are tempted to spend money, aren't we? All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to try to track our expenses. The fixed expenses are easy, aren't they? Those are the ones that are the same every month. That's your rent, your car payment, or your house payment. Those are easy. On page 17, I've got, um, this is a, you could make copies of this and put this in your wallet or your purse to keep track of those daily expenses that you you incur just on during the work week 
And those of us that use debit cards or cash, well, especially if you use cash, this would be a good one to use. And then there's another one. Actually, I think I brought mine. I did this myself. And it was very eye-opening. On page 20 and 21, oh, wait, I'm sorry, no, 18 and 19, I did this for a month. I actually tracked my expenses. And I use a debit card all the time. So what I would do is I would just, when I was logging my debit card receipts into my checkbook, I would go ahead and log them in here too so that I could see what I was spending. And I did it for a month. Was it fun? No. Was it easy? And it wasn't too bad. But it was a real eye-opener for me to see places that I didn't even realize I was spending money. Um, one of the things that jumped out to me on when I did it was uh, doctor office visit copays. Um, that's something that I don't figure in my budget, but those things will sneak up on you. Um, can you think of any other expenses that maybe you're not including in your budget, your monthly budget that you probably are actually incurring? I don't think about lunch at work as being an expense. I, I just don't. I forget about it because you have to eat something. Yeah. And I leave my house at 7 and I come back to my house at 11 and I have to eat something in right. that time. So and you're not just figuring that in there. Yeah. So that and would so be I'm always shocked. That if you did this at the end of a month, you no, would go. I would you would, yeah, no, you, would, you would think, wait a minute, maybe I need a plan and on Sundays I need to prepare the lunches and take them to work with me. But maybe that's not going to be a priority for you. But you need to, to see where it's going so that you can make decisions based on your lifestyle and what's important to you. Um, some things that I found when I did this that I hadn't included in my budget was dog grooming, um, birthday parties, birthdays, family member birthdays. Do we sit down and think our budget, well, this is March and my brother's birthday, you know, we don't do that. Um, that is one area that surprised me. Uh, weddings was another one, especially this time of year. You may um, encounter that a lot. I think one thing that catches up with, with me and my wife. Uh -huh. I mean, you know, that, and that's something that you don't do, and, but you do those quite often. Daycare clothes, especially in the wintertime, daycare clothes. We end up running over there, taking the kids or whatever. I mean, that could add up to an extra $120 a month easy. Sure. Just by unexpected trips. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think that you spend the most <coughs> money on? Groceries. Okay. Well, it seems like groceries. Groceries. Sky high. Yeah. I agree. That's what I think, too, is food. Statistics show that actually housing is the top. Um, but, of course, that's going to be, that's going to vary on each person's situation. I think food spending on the money in cars. Cars, transportation, yeah. Uh, I think actually on page 10 it tells you in, you know, kind of averages, housing's first, food's actually second. And transportation comes in at third. And it, of course that's going to vary depending on your, your individual situation. I have to revamp my lifestyle. I'm coming in underwater on groceries. <laughs> yeah. You know, one thing I, I think a lot of people also don't factor in on food is waste. Like, you go to the grocery yes. store, you buy all these groceries, you end up having a couple late nights at work, and before you yes. know it, the groceries you bought to cook a nice dinner. They're That's all been one of my soapboxes lately is how much food we are throwing away. I had yogurts, and those are not cheap, they're a dollar a piece. I threw away two because they expired. Now, wait a minute. You don't have to throw away some things that are expired. If it's been kept according to manufacturer's directions, you can still eat it for several weeks after it's expired absolutely yes. safely. Well, maybe this is an area I need to check into to, to decrease my expenses. There are some websites that it, will tell you that, you, yeah, because I've been talking about it on the news and some uh, articles, you know, that can I've heard eggs is one of the things that can stay past. Uh, but yogurt is made by fermentation. Therefore, as long as it's still alive, 
So it should be good. It's just more yogurty, apparently. <laughs> okay. Well, I like blue cheese. Does it just become more blue? <laughs> it's just like the water that sits in there. And it's expensive, too. So when you're figuring out your income and your expenses, hopefully you're going to come out with a positive number as need be. And are you saving money for that financial goal that we talked about earlier? And do you have adequate insurance? I am going to touch on insurance here in just a second as well. If you have a negative number, what are your options? But it's, yeah, unfortunately, that is, there's only two variables here. We're going to have to increase our income or we're going to have to decrease our expenses, right? So you, you may find out, you know, when you're figuring out what your financial goal is, you may figure out, you know, hey, I'm going to have to work a summer job or I'm going to have to work a weekend job. Yes. Most people aren't aware that we have a large number of TV stations that are available free with antenna. Oh, I didn't know that. So maybe you're going to discover that you are going to get rid of some fixed expenses such as cable. No, I'm not living without my HDTV. I'm no, sorry. No. <laughs> um, and that's because that's important to you. What's important to you may not be important to someone else. And you've got to yeah. identify those and be honest with yourself. You know, am I going to give, give up going to the hairdresser every six months? Not going to happen. I don't care. I'll get a second job before I would do that. But someone else, Jerry, I'm guessing it's probably, that's probably not real important for you no. going to the hairdresser every six months. So, again, it goes back to when we first started the session. You identify <coughs> what's important to you and what your uh, behaviors are with money. One of the things that I have done in the past is, um, actually, this leads right into next week's session. We're doing an eBay session, and I'm teaching that. But one of the ways that I increased my income was I started selling things on eBay. And that was a supplemental way for me to get income. So if I needed to be able to afford to go to the hairdresser, I was selling stuff on eBay to supplement that so that I could still afford to do that. Uh, and, you know, there's different variations of things that you could do. But again, there's only two options. You're going to have to increase your income or decrease your expenses or a combination of both. So we talked about some different apps that you could use um, to help you figure out your budget and keep track of your budget. Do what works for you. If a phone app doesn't work, don't, don't use that. Maybe you want to use a booklet like this. Maybe you want to use an envelope system and just use cash. Whatever works for you is what you need to do. There's not a right or wrong. And then you're going to want to monitor your progress. And remember when you were setting your goal, I asked you a specific time period. How, when do you want to achieve this? And they were all over the map. Kathy's was eight years. Jerry's was five. Natasha's was a year. Um, that's going to be personal to you. And then you're going to want to monitor your progress and check it monthly. So you can see, am I on track to get there in a year? Do I need to pay a little bit more towards my goal, or how am I doing? Did you have something, Jerry? Yeah, I, I don't want to sound like I keep plugging the bank I work for, but <coughs> really, if you bank with Wells Fargo, the online banking will do all this for you. It tracks everything, all your deposits. It tracks all your expenses, and it breaks it down in a chart that you can go review at any given time. It really does, and it, it's amazing. I, you know, whenever you start actually looking at it, what you spend money on. Mm -hmm. Where but, and you going. can set your savings goal. You can see some months I go on the negative for a month. I hate it, but it happens. I mean, you know, it's life. You know, yeah. Things that come up. So um, it's really eye when you start tracking on that. Level. But I just want to let you know that they that it is free and it's all online, so you don't have to do any kind of reporting for it. If you use your debit card and buy checks, it keeps track of all of it for you. And your bank may have an automatic savings. Uh, I mentioned to you where I went to the training, and I didn't expect to walk away with the financial goal set, but I did. And mine was to save for retirement, like Janet is. And so I said, okay, what realistically can I do to start saving for retirement? And so I set a specific goal of $100 a month. And I don't. I guess I'm missing one because... I've got 15 years, roughly, I guess, to, do the, to, to get to retirement. Um, but I did set a specific amount, and what I've got 
my bank doing is automatically pulling that out of my checking. So I don't have to remember to do that. It just automatically happens. So you, you could set your financial goal, maybe even to come up out of the, your payroll deduction and automatically. And you'd be surprised how quickly you just kind of forget that that's the, coming out and then you're going to see yourself reaching your financial goal that way. So an automatic deduction may be something that you want to look at. Um, this is along the lines of controlling expenses. You want to make sure that you're comparison shopping, especially if you're looking for big ticket items. Uh, how many of you all consider yourself comparison shoppers? Good. Yeah. I, don't, I sometimes get in that trap to where I will research something for a month before I actually purchase it. And I, I'm sure there's some diminishing return there where I get a little too obsessive about the comparison shopping. But and that's one way that you can control expenses. Um, I don't want to end this session without talking about insurance and how important that is to protect your assets. Because a setback can take you completely off course and destroy what you've already accomplished with your financial goals. So you don't want to ignore this part of um, the financial picture. You want to make sure that you do protect yourself with uh, auto, homeowners, health, life, and disability um, insurance. And if you think that that's unaffordable, if you think, well, no, I just can't afford to carry that insurance, you really can't afford not to have that coverage. And some things that you consider doing is maybe instead of going without insurance completely, go with a higher deductible. Because maybe if you have to go with a $5,000 deductible to get that premium where you can afford it, $5,000 is probably not going to financially ruin you, but a $100,000 bill would financially ruin you or has the potential to. So there's other ways of, um, getting the insurance if you don't feel like that you can handle it on your budget. Um, look at higher deductibles. Shop around. Just because you've been with the same company forever doesn't mean that there's not a better offer out there. And ask about discounts. Good student discount, good driver discount, um, whatever the case may be. But don't let that be an afterthought. I want you to make sure that you do protect your uh, the financial goals that you've achieved. I'd hate to see that get wiped out with just one setback. This is my contact information, and also we have, uh, People Incorporated has a Facebook page, and any trainings that we offer, we do list those on there, so I would encourage you to like our page, and I told you that we do have some programs that may assist you in reaching your financial goal, and I wanted to go over those with you um, as I wrap up here. One of the... Uh, if one of your financial goals is to start your own business, we can help you with that. We offer training and technical assistance. We also have a loan fund available for that. We don't compete with banks, so we want you to check with your bank. But um, if for whatever reason you were not able to get your money from your bank, we uh, are that next resource available to you. We also have a consumer loan program. Let's say that one of your goals is to get out of debt, and maybe that goal is, maybe you have quite a bit of credit card debt that's at 20% interest. You may want to look at doing a consolidation and do that at a lower interest rate. We have a consumer loan program that could help you achieve that. Um, we also use that for people that have gotten in payday lenders or title loan places. You, you are never going to get out of that cycle. So we have that loan fund available and that's in our Abingdon office. We're um, just less than a mile from here. We'd be glad to help you with any of those type things. And then the, the one thing that I wanted to mention, the free money that we have, if one of your goals is to buy a home or start a business or further your education or your child's education, this is our IDA program, and this is for every dollar that you save, they will match it with $2. There is not a catch other than the fact it has to be used for one of those three items, to buy a home, further your education, or start a business. They give you up to two years to save that money. You have to keep it in there a minimum of six months, but they allow you to save for up to two years. And your $2,000 savings could turn into $6,000. So it, it's a really good deal, and I would encourage you to take advantage of that if one of your goals is to do one of those three items. There are some income required, maximum income that you can have to qualify for the program, but I have the applications up here along with Gail 
her contact information is on here, and she's in our Abingdon office. Uh, this information. Yeah, I was writing about the IDA program. The IDA program. IDA program. Great. One thing. It's been organized. And it's being ordered. Written down. Yeah. I have to rewrite it down. And just being responsible with your money. And I like your your programs that you have, so we'll do some talking. Great. Knowledge. Knowledge. Knowledge is good. Knowledge yes. is power. Yes. Jerry? I pretty much live this stuff. So uh, but the stuff about people incorporated the other programs you have. Okay. I didn't know about the Oh, you didn't know about our IDA program? Uh, yeah. It's um it's an awesome program. Natasha? I said my goal out loud. You, yeah, see, so you've made it public, so it's official. You've got to do it. I have to do it. You know, we are accountable. I cannot uh, not do it. Yeah, yeah. we'll have to add. We'll check the challenge has been, has been made and met. Yeah. Jan? Accountability. Accountability. You have to be accountable, don't you? And new websites to check out. Oh, yeah. Okay, great. Jennifer? You're going to come to me. Well, I will say this, and I don't get to say it. I have been through Cindy's classes before, even before we started doing the new knowledge, I know Cindy. And I have taken tips and advice that Cindy has given me because, and I will say that they have worked and I have met a whole- Selling on eBay, I'll walk you through the process of starting, uh, opening an eBay account and all the tricks and trials and <coughs> mistakes that I made and let you learn from those, yes. I don't know if you have the answer to this question, but and you mentioned the credit reports and talked a little bit about that. How do you, what's the best way to manage credit card? Um, so for me, one of the things that impacts my, my credit report is that I have no credit card debt and that was credit report. Mm -hmm. So I got a Kohl's card, no revolving credit, I got a Kohl's card charged three hundred dollars at Christmas, paid it off in January, and now it's just sitting there mm -hmm. with zero and I'm like that it to me is such a waste of my time. And I don't even know if that makes a difference. Can you ex can you explain how So that what works? you have is a thin file is what um, Jerry can jump in here at a time too. Um, the, that's a thin file so there's not a, enough information for the algorithm think of the credit reporting agencies have these algorithms, and if they're if it's looking at yours and it only has one credit line, your American Express and or now the Kohl's, there's not a whole lot there for it to predict the likelihood of you paying back a loan if you took one out. That's all a credit score is, is what is the likelihood that you would repay a loan if you borrowed money? <coughs> There's not a whole lot of information for it to do all of its calculations to come up with a score. Mm -hmm. So what you're looking at is a thin file. How long have you had that card? I just got it this Christmas. Uh, Meet the American Express. Oh, uh, um, ten years or. Well, years. you've got the history then. Um, and but it's not reoccurring. You know, so. Yeah, the the problem with American Express is where it's a charge card that you basically have to pay the balance off every month, right? Whatever you charge off, so it's not revolving credit. So really what you need to do is get like Visa or MasterCard, a, a major revolving credit line. Your credit utilization is what's more important. So as long as you don't have to carry a balance every month of over 40% of your mm -hmm. total balance on the card, it reports positively through that algorithm. So <clears throat> for you, if you want to build that, just carry a little balance from month to month. Even if it's $10, $12, whatever it is, just something for it to pick up that algorithm that you're carrying a little bit of a balance over. And as long as you're not getting up to that 40% mark, it's not hurting you. Okay. It's actually helping you. Yeah. And, and one of the things you can consider is <clears throat> the Wells Fargo, they have a credit card. You can get their credit card. Buy your groceries with it. When a card comes in, like Jerry says, pay it off all the maybe five or six bucks. And then just keep building that history with that company. And it builds it on your credit record, too. Because they get to see two things that way. They get to see that you're carrying a little bit of a balance, and they get to see payment history, positive payment history. Because if you carry zero balance all the time, you never have any payment. Well, that's what I was thinking. I'm like, okay, I paid this off, and now it's sitting there, and it's at zero balance. So I actually have to use it, pay it off, but I can keep a low balance. Because, you know, the reason for not carrying credit card debt is the interest rates. 
Right. So if I have to do that just to increase, you know, I have to pay. You I know, can't I mean, it's it. a, if it's you a think, pay to play. Yeah, I was going to say, but if you think about, you know, if you carry, if you carry a $10 bounce from month to month, <laughs> even if it's 20% interest, it's okay. yeah. not, yeah. not going to. It's a computer trying to figure out the likelihood of you paying back your debts. And if it doesn't have anything, it doesn't know, well, hey, she has a debt. That looks awesome. Quite like common sense would be like three. So, um, so how long would you need to do that in order to have a, a positive impact on your credit report? I've seen credit scores go up. Six and, months. Yeah, six months, and sometimes shorter, depending on what the situation was. I've seen credit scores go up in three to four months if it's because somebody's over the credit limit. If they get that credit limit down, that automatically jumps their scores up because there's some things that um, have a high impact on your credit. But unfortunately, I mean, credit is a necessary thing, and you never know when you may need it. So I, I consider it a financial asset that needs to be managed and taken care of and nurtured, which it sounds like that's just the only thing that you have to do. It's a good situation to be in because a lot of, you know, a lot of people are in a situation where they have tons of credit and, and uh, it gets out of hand. So. You can have too much. Yes, you can have too much. Yeah. They make it really easy for us to have too much. Now, see, I don't think you can have too much. You can just use too much. Oh, well, true. <laughs> true. That's too much. <laughs> Having access to it as long as you have self-control. Um, mm. There was one point in time where I had um, $60,000 available to me on credit cards. Mm -hmm. And it's like, this is scary. So I called the one company and I said, I do not need $25,000 of your credit. And they said, well, we can reduce it to fifteen. And I said, that's fine. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't, I don't care that much on it. Yeah. You know, so. The only problems with doing that, though, is it, that it hurts you. Because if you can't carry any kind of balance on it. I was a kid in college at the time, so I was like, Let's not do that. Well, and I understand your reasoning for doing yeah. it. I'm just saying it does hurt you a little bit if you're carrying a balance because then it brings your utilization up. Yeah. So you kind of have to think about all that. Like I said, keep it, as long as you keep it under 40%, you're good. But if you get over that 40%. Now, the last time I was on, or the last time I played around with Credit Karma, it, it, there's a tool on there that says, if I do this, what effect would it have on my credit? Yeah. That may be something that you'll want to check into. Um, and so you, you're kind of uh, dress rehearsal. You're not actually making a commitment, but it will show you it. I remember it was on there before Credit Karma where it would tell you what effect this would have on your credit score. So you may want to play around with that as well. Yeah, I was going to say, I have a Capital One credit card that has that too. Yeah, yeah. and some of the credit cards are doing that now as well. Simulate to give score if you make so many payments on time or, or whatever, reduce your balances on cards. You simulate what your score would be. Yeah, there's a lot of good tools out there. Well, that's the end of the session today. I'm sure you all have to get back to work. Thank you for coming, and be sure to join us next Wednesday.